your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. How many do not know that song? How many know that song? Well, if you know it, sing it for crying out loud. <laughs> Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Father, that's why we are here. Thank you for the beauty of this place, the food we've enjoyed, the fellowship that's been in play, the friendships that are being made. It's all a wonderful blessing, but Father, all those things are secondary to the opportunity you've given to me and to us to turn our eyes upon Jesus, to refix our focus on the author and perfecter of faith. Father, I pray for these guys and gals. I pray for this gang. That, Lord, as the day unfolds and as the evening comes, that we might look back and say this was a day when we were in communion with your son, talking to him and pouring out our heart before him and receiving from him that healing, that help. And so, Father, bless each man, each woman, each couple. In this session too, Lord, I pray that we would hear the beat of your heart and the work of your spirit would be at work in each of our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 <laughs> Jesus is the Savior. Do you know that? And what does a Savior do? Saves. He saves. Jesus saves, not just in the past tense, in our before Christ days when he reached out to you and me and brought us into his family, but he continues to save us in the stormy days of whatever sea we're sailing on, whatever thing we're dealing with, Jesus saves. And he will continue to until one day he catches you and me up by the hand and takes us to heaven. We're gonna be home at last where we all, whether you know it or not, are craving and longing to be. Jesus saves. And last night, a bunch of you prayed. A bunch of us prayed. And part of the prayer that we prayed, perhaps in some cases most passionately, was for our families, for our kids, Maybe grandkids. <laughs> you see, the Apostle John put it this way. John said, towards the end of his days, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. He wrote that in 3 John. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And I think that same thing is true for you and for me in our family. There's no greater joy than to see our kids get it and go for it. Loving the Lord, serving the Lord, walking with the Lord. There's no greater joy. I I've got five kids. And I tell you, the most joyous thing for me, of all the things I, I get to do and, and participate in, 
the greatest joy by far that I have is to watch my kids and my grandkids walk with the Lord. There's no greater joy <laughs> than to see kids or, or, or grandkids say no to the world and yes to the Lord. But also, I believe there's probably no greater heartache than if one of our kids, or two, or three, or a grandkid, whatever their ages might be, you know they're not where they should be. They're not doing what they ought to be. They're not who you thought they would be. They're going through a time when they seem to be just wandering off in the wrong direction. Maybe it's a junior higher that all of a sudden is, is, is talking in ways that are raunchy and disconcerting. Maybe it's a high school senior that you know is out with the boys drinking. Maybe it's a college sophomore that came home during break and said to you, I don't think I really believe the Bible is true. Maybe it's a 35-year-old daughter who just seems to be cold towards the Lord when once she was on fire for the Lord. Maybe it's a grandson that you had such, such pride in, but now he just seems to be disinterested in the things of the Lord. I tell you, I don't think there's any greater sorrow or heartache than if we see a son, a daughter, whatever age they might be, or a grandchild, going astray. It breaks the heart. And I know that in a group like this, a bunch of you prayed last night saying, Lord, be merciful to my, to my son. He's only six, but already he's showing a stubbornness. He's showing a, a, an attitude. He's got a chip on his shoulder. I can already see what's coming, Lord. And I just pray, have mercy on him. <laughs> and do a work in him. Or maybe he's 56. And you're going, he just doesn't seem to get it. If you have a person in your family kids, grandkids, who is not walking in the way they ought to be. Or if you're a couple here that have no kids, listen carefully. Because you're going to have kids and you're going to be prepared a bit more perhaps because of our discussion this morning about what to do when one of your kids appears to be going south. Turn with me to the book of Jeremiah, and Jeremiah was not and is not a bullfrog, but turn there to the book of Jeremiah, Old Testament, a bit after Psalms, which is right in the middle, chapter 31. The Lord speaking a prophecy that you Bible students will recognize as part of the Christmas story. But it has all sorts of applications both historically and prophetically and today for you and me personally as it relates to our families. It's a prophecy where the Lord speaks to and through Jeremiah saying in verse 15 of Jeremiah 31. Thus saith the Lord. A voice was heard in Rama, lamentation, bitter weeping. Rachel weeping for her children refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. Thus saith the Lord, verse 16, refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy, and there is hope in thine end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their own border. 
Rachel was weeping for her children. Later on, this would be applied to the Christmas story when Herod slaughtered those innocent little boys in Bethlehem, hoping to snuff out the life of this new king that seemed to be born, Jesus of Nazareth. It spoke to them in Jeremiah's day of, of, of a captivity that was underway, and their children, the children of Israel, the children of Judah being hauled off into captivity. It speaks to you and me in a personal way because we too can be weeping because our children are not, just like it says here. They're just not. They're not what they should be, not what they could be, not what we thought they would be. They're just not, not heads. <laughs> and there's a weeping that takes place in our hearts. And we refuse to be comforted so frequently because no matter what might be going right in our lives or what blessings might be coming our way, the fact of the matter is we just can't get free of the brokenness in our heart over the situation of our kids, a son, a daughter, an in-law, whatever, because they're not. They're just not. When your child, if your child, should your child or children or grandkids go south. Remember this, it is not necessarily at all because you failed as a parent. Don't assume that, Christians do. Don't assume it's your fault. You have to realize, number one, that there is an enemy that is determined to destroy our children. His name is Satan. Satan seeks going about as a roaring lion to strike, to kill, to devour. And just because there's been an attack on one of your kids or some of your kids, understand this, it doesn't mean that you failed. Did, 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 did God the Father fail? When one third of the angels rebelled against him and went south, did he think there in heaven, oh, I could have been a better father. One third of the angels rebelled against me and it must mean that I am an inadequate father or I blew it in some way. No. Did God blow it when he made Adam and Eve his first kids and they rebelled against him and plunged the whole world into sin? Did God say, oh, I failed again. My kids, Adam and Eve, rebelled against me and are hiding from me in the bushes someplace here in the garden. Did, did Jesus, our hero, fail when he looked at his family, his guys? He said, these are my brethren, my mother and my sisters, pointing to his guys, his disciples. This is my family. And yet, and yet Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. Thomas doubted him. Did Jesus fail? I think not. In fact, let me suggest to you something. If you have a son or a daughter right now that you're thinking of, or a grandkid that you're aware of that seems to be just so obstinate, it could be that even as Jesus said to his main man, Peter, 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 Satan desires to have thee and sift thee like wheat. But I have prayed for thee, Pete. And when you do overcome, not if, but when you do overcome, strengthen the other brothers. You see, Jesus knew that the devil had targeted Peter because Peter was was the leader of the pack of those disciples. He had a great big target, Peter did, on his back. And I suggest to you that if your kids seem to be being sifted like wheat, and Satan desires to have them, and they're being pulled away like Peter that day, standing by the fires of the enemy, warming themselves in the fires of the enemy, oh my. It might very well mean that like Jesus said to Pete that day, 
Hey, it's because Satan has targeted him or her. Because Satan sees that they are very special. Or, or it might be that the Lord says, oh my, I've chosen him, her, this guy, that girl to be part of my family, but they're kind of a strong-willed child. They've got some issues they're going to be working through. Who can I entrust that difficult kid to? I know I'll put him in your family or your family or your family because I can trust you with this kind of difficulty. So don't assume that when the kids go south or a child seems to be obstinate or difficult or hard, that you did something wrong. Again, the Father didn't fail in heaven. Jesus didn't fail on earth. They had rebellion in their homes. There is an enemy that seeks to devour my kids, your kids, our kids. He's as a roaring lion on the prowl. So don't think that you failed necessarily. Secondly, not only is there an enemy that is determined to destroy our children, but check this out. There is a father who has destined to save our children. A father who has destined to save our kids. What do you mean, John? Weep not, our text says, don't cry. Stop your weeping, your sobbing, your sorrowing. Your work shall be, what does it say? Rewarded. What work? They asked Jesus one day, what must we do to do the works of God? And Jesus looked at them and said, this is the work, singular, of God. That you believe on him whom the Father hath sent. Huh? What do we do to do the works of God? Ah. This is the work of God, one thing, that you believe on me, Jesus said to those guys that day. You've done that. You've believed on the Lord. You've believed in the Lord. You're born again. You're followers of him. You're Christians. Your work shall be rewarded. What do you mean? You're believing. You see, you might recall the story. There in Acts chapter 16, Paul was in prison and he and his compadre Silas began to praise the Lord in the midnight hour and as they did so, it's almost as though the Father in heaven heard their songs and started tapping his feet too and the ground began to quake. There was a great shaking of the ground there in that jail in Philippi. And the prison doors flung open. And Paul and Silas were in prison with the other guys too. And the jailer who realized the prison doors had sprung open grabbed a sword and was about to plunge that sword through his chest. Commit suicide because in those days... If a jailer lost a prisoner, a prisoner escaped out of his jail, he, the jailer, would be put to death. So he grabs this sword about to do himself in when Paul said, hey, 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 hold on, buddy. Slight paraphrase there. No need for that. Paul says, I know the prison doors are open, but, 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 but we're still all here. By the way, Bible students, we're still all here, not just Paul and Silas, but all the prisoners stayed. When those prison doors opened, you would think there would have been a mass exodus out of that prison, that jail, that cell, but they all stayed. Why? I suggest to you, because those guys in prison were so intrigued by Paul and Silas worshiping and praising and rejoicing in a dank, dark, damp dungeon, they thought those guys are free even while they're in prison. Those guys are different than we are. Those guys have something that we don't. 
and they stayed around to find out what it was. When they could have made a jailbreak easily, they too stayed because I think, in my opinion, they wanted to know the rest of the story. They stayed there too. Paul said, we're all here. And the jailer said, whoa. And he was blown away. And then he looked on Paul and said to Paul, what must I do to be saved? Wonder why you're in that jail that you're in? Sister, married to that guy? So you have the opportunity to praise the Lord and let others who feel jailed in their marriage see that you are free even in that condition that's not so easy. Paul said, you believe, sir, on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And then he said this, and your house. Mr. and Mrs. Jailer and the little jailers will all be saved. <laughs> the whole kit and caboodle, the whole gang. Had Paul met Mrs. Jailer? Did he know the little jailers? No. But Paul understood a principle. You, sir, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and your house, your family. Paul, 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 Paul was a rabbi. He understood the story of the Exodus, as I alluded to briefly last night, when the father of the home applied the blood of the lamb on the top post, the basin, the sap below, both side posts of the home, in the form of a cross that blood would be, and all those that were inside his house, when he applied the blood, the whole house was saved. That's why Joshua, Paul would know this, and 24 of Joshua would say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Not, we're gonna try to, I'm praying that we might end up okay. He said, no, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You see, here's what you need to understand. You need to know, the Lord put my five kids in my house because they were already destined to be born again, spirit-filled, on fire Christians. They were already destined to be part of his family. God put them in my house knowing that the blood would be applied, that prayers would ascend, that the word would be heard. Peter John, when he first started teaching, my oldest son, when he was doing some preaching and teaching around the age of 15 or so, he said, Dad, I'm a little confused. He said, am I preaching and teaching because my last name is Corson? And you're a teacher, and so people ask me to teach or what have you. I said, Peter John, listen to me. You're not preaching and teaching because you're a Corson. I said, you're a Corson because you were called to be a preacher before the foundation of the world. God said, Peter, John, you're going to be one of my followers, and you're going to be an explainer of truth, a teacher of scripture. Where can I put you? Hmm. Into what family can I put you to help that be fostered and encouraged? I know, I'll put you in John Corson's house. So Peter John was born, along with Jessica Lee and Christy Ann and Mary Elizabeth and Benjamin Barrett. My kids were ordained to be Christians, and so God put them in my house. So too for you. Your kids are ordained to be believers. That's why he put them in your house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved, and your house. Rachel, Jeremiah 31 that we read through and looked at. Refrain from weeping, you're crying, you're sobbing, but your children shall return from the land of the enemy. They shall return to their own borders, their own boundaries. He knew that. He understood this. Who? Y'all know about him? The guy that built the ark? Noah? 
<laughs> Check this out. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. If you have a hard time finding it, you can just listen and perhaps maybe jot it down if you choose, look it up later, or you can turn there with me to Hebrews chapter 11, the great faith chapter. Now faith, Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now faith, are you there? Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not yet seen. Faith is the substance, it's the thing of things hoped for. Hope in the Bible is not, oh, I hope it happens. No, hope is the absolute expectation of coming good. It's a confident expectation. Faith is the substance of things I'm expecting to happen. The evidence of things not yet seen is the idea there in the language of Hebrews. It says this, without faith, verse 6, it is impossible to please him. There are many ways to please God, but none apart from faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Why is that? Because faith, faith, listen, faith, listen, faith is the lingua franca of heaven. It's the language of eternity. The Lord is shaping you, shaping me, shaping us to rule and reign with him throughout eternity. And faith is the language of eternity. And the Lord says, I'm going to teach you now. You're being schooled in this life to learn the language of faith. Senorita Martinez, best teacher I ever had. As a freshman in high school, she was my Spanish one teacher. Bless her heart. And she stood up on that first day of class and said to us, 30 approximately freshmen in high school, this is the last English word you're going to hear in this class. And that was it. From then on, everything she did and said, it was only in Spanish. We were forced. We were absolutely forced in what at that time initially seemed to be cruel and unusual punishment <laughs> to learn Spanish. But she was a master teacher who knew that's what it would take. Hey, I'm just going to force you to learn to understand my way that you'll be fluent in Spanish one day soon. Vaya con Dios, señorita. <laughs> Father says, I'm going to make you learn the language of faith. You're going to go through things that are troubling, disconcerting, heartbreaking, gut-wrenching, and I want you to trust me. Well, why? Because you're going to learn the language of faith. Well, why? Because it's going to be important for the next million, billion, trillion, quazillion, billion years. Faith is going to be important, and you're going to say one day when you see me, son, thanks, Dad. Thank you, Father, for teaching me faith, because now I see how important it is, not just in that short little life I lived on earth, but for all these ages that I'm now enjoying with you, how essential faith was. You, you, you forced me to walk by faith and not by sight. Listen, listen, the verse here says, without faith it is what? Impossible to please him. But he that cometh to God must believe that he is, he is what? Ah. Truly, Psalm 73, 1 says, truly God is good. God's good. You must believe that God is what? First John says, God is love. You believe that God is good, God is love, that God cares. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. But he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is what else? A rewarder of them who, what gang? 
diligently seek him. A rewarder of those that diligently seek him. That was my simple message to you, to us, to me last night. Seek him. Talk to him. Don't look to anyone or anything else primarily. First, you seek the Lord with expectancy and persistency and diligently. Why? Because he's the Savior. They came to J the B one day, John the Baptist, and said, tell us, are you the Christ? I am not the Christ. If you look to that husband, that pastor, that book, that counselor, are you the Christ, the Savior? Nope. But I know who is. Jesus. Talk to him. Talk to him with expectancy. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. But he that cometh to God must believe that he is good. He is love. He is who he says he is. And a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Now, here's what I want you to see. Look down to the next verse, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear or reverence, prepared an ark, and watch this next phrase, kids, to the saving of his house. He prepared an ark, not primarily to save the kangaroos and rhinoceroses, although he did that too. He prepared an ark for the saving of his house, his family. Mrs. Noah, Ham, Sham, Japheth, and their wives too. By faith, for a hundred years, he pounded away day after day after day, building that ark. Why? To provide a place of salvation for his family by faith. Now here's the trick, here's the catch, here's the kicker, here's the punchline. He built that ark with places for his boys and their wives 20 years before his first son was born. He started providing a place of salvation for his sons and their wives 20 years before his first son was born. He said, by faith, I believe that at the end of the day, my kids and their spouses, hey, they're going to be on board. They're going to be saved. And he just pounded away day after day after day after day. People laughed at him, made fun of him, but he kept on pounding away by faith. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved and thy house. Apply the blood on the doorposts of the home and your house will be saved. By faith, Noah prepared a place on the ark to save his family. He believed that his family would be on board ultimately. Oh, they might wander off for a while. They might go into the land of the enemy for a season. But they're coming back. Quit your weeping, Rachel. Jeremiah 31. Quit your blubbering. Quit your crying. It's too late. J. Iris, it's just too late. What do you mean? Your daughter's dead. He looked, no doubt, at Jesus, who he went to get, he went to fetch, to bring him to his house, to touch his daughter. It's too late, Jairus. Jesus said, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. And it says that they laughed him to scorn. They thought that was craziness. She's as dead as a doornail. Rigor mortis maybe has already begun to set in. What do you mean? Then Jesus said to Jairus, Matthew 9 tells you and me, move out the mockers. 
those that are mocking, those that are doubting, those that are scoffing, those that are not believing, move them out. They moved out the mockers. Jesus then goes into the house, grabs that little girl's hand who's laying there on the bed, seemingly dead, and says, Talitha Kumi, arise, little lammy. And she arose. And then you got to love Jesus for this. He said, get her a burger. <laughs> get her something to eat. I, I, that's my kind of guy. <laughs> and they marveled. But notice, listen, Jesus, Jesus didn't go in until the mockers were moved out. Rachel, refrain from weeping. Don't get this sadness, this sorrow, this... Why? It's so practical. Because if your kids, whether they be six or 56, if they sense that you're concerned about them, sad about them, worried about them, they will pick up on that and live down to that. If they know that you're just weeping and sobbing, oh, Johnny, how could you? Oh, Susie, why would you? Oh, Mary, what's with you? You know, I was so blessed. I, too, grew up in a Christian home. And I don't think there was a day that went by, at least I can't remember a day that went by, where my mom or my dad, particularly my mom, would say to me, Johnny, God's hand is on you. And he's going to use you big time. And I grew up just believing that. I just grew up, I, I didn't know not to believe it. And, and mom just every day, and dad sometimes too. Mom was more vocal. Dad was a wonderful believer as well. But mom would just say, God's hand is on you. He's going to use you. And I grew up that way. I watch others who grow up in a home, a Christian home, where they sense that dad, that mom, is just so worried, and there's a sadness in their eyes, like Rachel in our text, weeping because her kids were not. You're just not what you should be. You're not where you're supposed to be. You're in the land of the enemy. And kids pick up on that. And they say, oh, wow. I guess I'm a double loser, aren't I, spiritually? But what if instead, I know that a lot of you know this, but, but, but what if instead our kids sensed in us a smile on our face, a sparkle in our eye, a confidence in our speech? Hey, you might be playing around over here or messing up with that, but I got news for you. God's not giving up on you. He's got his hand on you. He's never going to leave nor forsake you. You're his. He put you in my house. I believe in him. I did that work, the work of believing on Jesus Christ. And my work, Jeremiah 31, is going to be rewarded. And I just know, sweetie pie, I know, son, that God's got his hand on you. And I have prayed for you. And when you are converted, Strengthen the others, as Jesus said to Peter. When you get through this, are you saying we can tell our kids to just go out and sin? No, we say to them, listen, God has in play what I call a rubber band theology. And that is an elastic band of love is wrapped around you, son. And if this is the Lord and you have this band around you because you're linked to him, but you get away, you start moving away, you start wandering away, stretching that band, you're, 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 you're going to come back. The question is, how hard will the smash be? <laughs> the farther you stretch that band, oh... The uglier it's going to be, son. But God's not letting go of you, and neither am I. I know. And even if you smash against the proverbial wall, God will use that too. But it's really a painful way to go. 
avoid the heartache and the heartbreak, son. Sweetie pie, honey, don't do that because here's why. Sin, sin, sin is not bad because God forbids it. God forbids it because it's bad. Thanks, Dad. You bet, sweetie pie. I believe that God's got his hand on you. It's not me being a good dad. It's I have a great father who has his hand on you. Rachel weeping for her children because they were not. Refrain thine eyes from crying and thy voice from weeping, for your children shall return again from the land of the enemy. They shall return again into their own boundaries. The prophecy. Wouldn't it be radical, perhaps, for your kids or grandkids, adult kids, little kids, whatever they might be, if when you go back, all of a sudden there's a change in the house, the mockers are moved out. Those that say, oh, this is horrible, this is terrible, what a tragedy, what a horrible thing this is that you're behaving this way, you're not getting it. What if all that was moved out? And instead, you let the Lord move in. What do you mean? You just call on my name, and you know wherever I am, I'll come running. Winter, spring, summer, or fall. All you got to do is, and I'll be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've got a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. You know that song? Sing with me. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, she was so happy. The family, the family was, was delivered. She thought, as they all did, this is the end. Here comes Pharaoh with his chariots and his massive army, and we're trapped. Piahiroth on this side, Migdal on that side, two mountains with our backs to the Red Sea. But you all know the story. You saw Charlton Heston's movie. <laughs> the Red Sea parted miraculously. The family, all of them, every one of them, none left behind. The family, the children of Israel, all go over to the other side and then Pharaoh the bad guy comes racing after them the walls of water collapse on him and he and his boys go down you know the story the family was delivered because one man had faith father Moses what happened then oh, that's when she the one I was talking about she Moses' sister, Miriam, took the tambourine and began to shake the tambourine and she began to sing and the ladies joined in with her and they all began to sing and dance. The Lord has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider of Pharaoh hath he thrown into the sea. And they began to worship and sing and that's wonderful. But you know, it could have been a lot better. Had Miriam taken the tambourine on this side of the Red Sea, before the waters parted, before the family was all on the other side safely, before the miracle took happen, Miriam, what you did was fine, but you could have been great. How? By shaking the tambourine before you see anything happening and saying, the Lord has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider, it's already a done deal. Our family, children of Israel, we're all going to be safe at the end of the day. 
And she would have went down as one of the all-time greats. And so are you going to be going down in a great way? When you shake the tambourine right now and say, I'm not at the Red Sea, but I'm at Lake Las Vegas or whatever that is out there. <laughs> and I'm believing, and I'm believing from this day on, I'm going to be a different kind of mother, a different kind of granddad, a different kind of spouse. I'm going to start rejoicing, saying, Lord, I believe that all of my kids and their spouses and my grandkids are going to be on board at the end of the day. And I'm going to pound away the hammer, the hammer that nailed your hands to the cross, showing me and my family how much you love us. And the nails, oh my goodness, it's as secure and certain as the Bible declares, fastening a nail into the wall. I'm believing, Lord, because of your love and your promises, the cross and the scripture, I'm going to believe that my family is going to come on board and sail away with me safely to heaven at the end of the day. Move out the mockers. Shake the tambourine now. Apply the blood. I know you have. Believe his word. Without faith, it's impossible. Refrain from weeping. Don't let your kids think they're not. Let them know that they are chosen of the Lord, destined for heaven. I wasn't planning on sharing this particular understanding, but I felt early this morning, I really felt that the Lord was whispering into my ear, there's some folks that are here this weekend and they're not even able to enjoy what's taking place in the way that I would want them to because they're burdened about a child. They're burdened and they're weeping. Johnny, that's what the Lord calls me. You tell them to refrain from weeping. You tell them to start believing. You tell them their work in believing on me will be rewarded. You tell them to change the atmosphere in their house starting tonight when they get back home again. You tell them to move the mockers out and let me come in. You tell them I'm the savior of their family too. And watch and see, John, what I'm going to do in the hearts of some. Maybe that's you. Would you bow your heads, please? I'm going to ask you to just sort of respect the privacy in this moment at this time. of other couples, but I'm going to ask you as a couple, if you're here and say, you know, my heart has been broken about my high school daughter, my grown son, my elementary school kid that just is seeming to be not. And today I'm believing this word that the Lord, you say, John, had you share with us. And I want to look at that child of mine, that son, that granddaughter, and say what Jesus said to his boy, Peter. Satan, I know, desires to have you and sift you like weak, but I have prayed for you. And when you get through this, and you will, strengthen the others. And he did. But I'm going to ask you right now to do something that I think is important. 
I'm going to ask you if you say, I I'm receiving this today. I I I'm taking the, the exhortation as my own, as a prophetic word. And I, by God's grace, am going to obey and start believing and rejoicing and refrain from weeping and shake the tambourine. And I'm going to start to believe that God loves my kids more than I do. And if you're in that place where you say, I'm owning this, and John, if you wouldn't mind, would you just pray a simple prayer for me? I like to pray for every couple, any couple, who says, yep, I get it. And I'm going to start believing right here, right now, today. Would you lift your hand up if that's you? And would you just keep it up? Anybody else want to join these who say, I'm in, I'm there, that's me? Would you keep your hand up? Father, we read last night, and we know it's true that our hero, your son, reached out his hand to Peter, who was going down quickly. And you pulled him up. And now today, Lord, a bunch of us are lifting up our hands because we've been sinking a bit in despair, in doubt, in fear, in discouragement. Lord, I know such things affect our marriages, affect everything. So now, Lord, with these hands that are up, I, I thank you for them. I believe, Jesus, that you're in this place. I believe that you're in the house. And I pray that you would take the hands of each person whose hand is lifted up and grab that hand, that heart, and fill that heart with hope. Give them a certainty. Give them a peace that passes understanding. Give them a joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. Cause these couples to go home. And Father, may the devils and demons of doubt and darkness and depravity be flushed out and sent packing and bound up and cast away. And I pray that those homes would now be homes of shalom, homes of peace. Homes of life where little lammies would be brought back and raised up. Where in-laws would be on board. Where grandkids would be safe. We plead the blood, Father of Jesus. We know each of us whose hands are held up. We know we've dropped the ball. We know we've missed the mark. We know we've erred. But we claim the power of the blood, Father of your Son. We believe there's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. We apply the blood to the doorposts of our own lives and to the doorposts of our family home. And we know that there's power therein. And Satan, you are bound because of the blood of Jesus Christ that removes that place of entry due to our sin it's washed away as far as the east is from the west, buried in the deepest sea. And Father, you're the best, and we thank you for the blood. We apply the blood. We believe now, Lord, that that death angel is passing over and not coming in. We believe, Lord, that these kids of ours are going to come through it and return back to their own boundaries return out of the land of the enemy back to their own homes for you told us lord train up a child in the way that he should go and even when he is old he will not depart from it lord we believe it we're embracing it thank you jesus thank you jesus thank you jesus hallelujah lord would you all stand with me Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, 
for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich and free. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. And we're going to sing his praise with our kids and families right there beside us, around his throne, not taking pride in how good we were as parents, but how gracious he is and the power of the blood that was shed. <laughs> heaven. I've got a daughter in heaven. She went when she was 16. I've got a wife in heaven when I was 29. My wife was 29. She was taken to heaven too. And I had three little kids left behind with me, five and two and one. I was single as a single parent for three years. And then the Lord brought me my present bride. And a few days ago, we had our 28th anniversary. And the Lord gave us two more kids. Like you, I know, like you, I've been through some stuff too. And I have found that he is faithful. Through many dangers, toils and snares, we have already come. But it's grace that's brought us safe this far. And grace will lead us home. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all my... You guys aren't church guys, are you? <laughs> That's all. Just sing that with me. Just jump in. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all my sin. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all my sin. What can wash away my sin. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No 
another fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ in play, cleansing me, cleansing you, cleansing each of us this day from our shortcomings as husbands, our shortcomings as wives, our shortcomings as parents or as grandparents. My, oh my, we fail, but Jesus never fails. Oh, I could keep singing all day. I better not. He just never fails. He never fails. He's the savior of my soul. And when you feel you're going down in your home or with your spouse, Lord, save me. And he'll prove to be your savior. I guarantee you watch, you wait, you'll see.